Okay, welcome to Intermediate Python Week 2, Lecture 1. There's only one set of notes for this week in this uh, uh, called 3-files numpy.pdf, but it's a very long chapter, and so I'm going to split this into two separate lectures. So we're going to take a look now at NumPy, which is a very important data structure, a very efficient data structure, mostly used for dealing with numerical data. It can also be used to contain things like strings and Boolean data, but mostly this is intended for very efficient processing of numerical data. So as a brief review uh, about data structures, uh, suppose that you have a list, <clears throat> and the name of the list is Bob. The name of the variable that refers to the list is Bob. And this list may contain duplicate values. What is going to be our best way that we've learned how to remove these duplicates? Now, we're not arguing that this is the best possible way of all. Just uh, in terms of things that we've learned, what is a straightforward and easy way of eliminating these duplicates. Can we say Bob dot remove duplicates? Can we say Bob gets a tuple from Bob? Or Bob gets a set from Bob? Or Bob gets a list from a set from Bob? Which one of those is the best possibility? Well, uh, the list data type does not have any named method called remove duplicates. It does have many named methods like insert and append and sort and reverse and index and count, but it doesn't have something called remove duplicates. So A is not legal at all. Converting Bob to a tuple will not eliminate duplicates. And all it will do, in fact, is to take all of the items in the Bob list and create a tuple from those with all of the same values in the same order. So if we had duplicates in the list named Bob, we're now going to have a duplicates in the tuple named Bob. Answer C, in which we're saying Bob gets a set of the items from the list Bob, well, that does eliminate duplicates because remember that a set cannot contain duplicate values and so by converting a list to a set we're going to end up with the same collection of values but only one occurrence of each value. The problem with C is that we end up with Bob being a set and our desire here is to have is to take this list named Bob and end up with a list named Bob that has these duplicates removed. And so the best thing to do, or the most straightforward thing to do that we know how to do, is to take the list Bob, which has duplicates, create from that a set, which does not have duplicates, and then create from that set a list, which now contains the same items that Bob originally had, but with duplicates eliminated. And we're going to reuse the variable name Bob to refer to that list with duplicates gone. All right, now we're going to take a look at an example involving functions. So suppose we have a function named Bob that does not take any argument, and it returns both a float and an int. That is, it has a return statement in it with a float value and then a comma and then an int value. So we get two values back. Well, we get these two values, this float value and this int value, back from Bob. How should we call Bob in order to get those values? Well, I guess by getting those values, we mean uh, get those values in such a way that we can use those values in some, uh, for some purpose. The first possibility is, okay, well, we'll just call Bob. The second is we're going to say A comma B gets the return value from Bob. Or in the third case, we're going to say A gets Bob, and then we're going to say B gets Bob. So we'll call Bob twice, 
and create these variables A and B to refer to uh, what comes back from Bob each time. Or finally, another option is that this isn't allowed because a function can only return one thing. Well, okay, so it is true that a function can only return one thing, but that one thing can be a tuple consisting of multiple values. And so if I do say, uh, let me define Bob over here. If I do say return 123.4 and 33, and I say and I call Bob, notice that what I get back is a tuple. So on the one hand, it is one thing, but on the other hand, it is one thing that contains two values. So answer D is not correct. Now answer A, that's actually what I just did here, and so fine, it does return this tuple containing the float and the int, but I haven't saved any of that information into variables, so I can't really do anything with it. So that isn't quite right. The correct thing to do is, is this. We can say a comma b gets Bob. And this is what's called multiple assignment. Since the tuple that Bob returns has two items in it, I can use multiple assignment a, a comma b gets the tuple from Bob to split the first item from the tuple into a and the second item from the tuple into b. So a now refers to 123.4 and B refers to 33. Answer C is incorrect because if I say A gets Bob, that just means that the tuple Bob returns is now referred to by A. So A is a tuple, it's not a single value. And if I say B gets Bob, once again, B is now a tuple, it's not a single value. So remember this multiple assignment trick where if a function does return a tuple of multiple values you can uh, assign those values in the tuple individually uh, to variables and the restriction is that you have to have exactly the same number of variables on the left side of the assignment operator as they exist in the tuple returned by that function all right now as an aside I have I have said that when I define Bob this way and I say return 1234 comma 33, that that creates a tuple by default. It is possible to create and return a list of two items or to create and return a set of two items. And in those cases, the multiple assignment will still, uh, will still work. But the most common situation here is, uh, is what we've shown uh, if you return value comma value, what you get back by default is a tuple, which can then be multiply assigned. Okay. We also talked about files and what can go wrong with reading and writing files. Well, there are several things. Uh, one of the most common things is that you can forget to close a file. This is particularly bad when you are writing data into a file because it turns out that between your program and the system that's going to contain this file is some memory called the the buffer and the buffer exists between your program and the disk to improve efficiency so that as you write individual characters out to the disk uh, those individual characters are not actually directly written to the disk if you've got a file of several thousand characters, I'm sorry, if you've got a data set in your program of several thousand characters, and you write that out to the disk one character at a time, uh, that's going to be a very slow operation. So what we want to do is to collect up or buffer up, let's say 1K or 2K worth of those characters that you're going to write, and then we want to write that entire block of characters, that 1K or 2K chunk, into the file on disk for efficiency. Now the problem is that if your program uh, dies and you have not closed the file, there may be some residual information in that buffer 
that never does get sent out to the file on disk. And so you may discover that your file on disk either doesn't exist at all uh, or only contains partial data. So especially when you're producing an output file, you must remember to close that output file. You should do the same thing for when you're reading from a file as well. Another problem that can occur is that the file that you've requested might not be found, um, either because you're searching for the file in the you're searching for the file in the wrong directory, uh, or you have specified an incorrect file name, uh, or the file really just isn't there in the case where you're trying to open it for reading, uh, or possibly you might not have permission to read data from the file or to write data into uh, a file. So there are a variety of things that can go wrong uh, when you're attempting to read from or write to a file. Another problem that can occur is that the format of the data, and here we're talking about input files, can be corrupted. That is, you're attempting to read a file and you're assuming that the file is constructed in a certain way that maybe has uh, comma-separated values of floating-point numbers, but it turns out that what's actually in the file are strings, and they're not separated by commas. Maybe some lines have 10 fields, maybe other lines have 6 fields, uh, on and on. So there are all kinds of problems that occur can occur if the data in the file does not match the uh, structure that you expect it to match, uh, especially when you're trying to read input. Okay, so not all of these have a, an immediate solution that you can apply within your program. Uh, uh, some of them you can uh, deal with directly in your program. Others are probably going to require you to either debug the, uh, the, the program to, to correct the program to expect the kind of data that the, program, that the file actually provides, uh, or else you'll have to work outside the program to make sure that the file that you, your program wants uh, is in the correct place, does have the correct permissions, does contain correctly structured data, etc. Here's a way of avoiding I guess I can't highlight the title. Um, here's a way of automatically closing a file when you're done using the file. And this is the with as statement or structure. So instead of saying uh, some variable f gets open of some file for reading, and then you need to remember to say f.close when you're all done. If instead of that you say with open the file as some variable name, now f is the open file, and you can access f, for example, in a for loop, just as you would do with a file that you'd open by saying f gets open. But the cool thing is that as soon as you're out of this with uh, structure, the file will automatically be closed. And you don't have to remember to do the f.close uh, yourself. So that's a very common thing to, uh, to use. Uh, this doesn't solve the problem if the file doesn't exist, or if you don't have access to it, or if you try to open a file that's not in the correct directory, or what have you. But this will handle the file closing problem. Now, for handling other kinds of problems where the file does exist, uh, or, or for that matter, uh, okay, let me, let me unwind. <laughs> I'm talking too fast. Okay, so uh, what if the file doesn't exist? Or what if the file doesn't exist? That's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> what if a file doesn't exist? Or what if a file does exist, but you don't actually have permission to read it? Well, in those two cases, when you attempt to open the file for reading, the open function is going to fail. And it turns out when that 
open function fails, it does something called raising an exception. And you can use something called a try except, <laughs> a try except structure uh, to deal with that kind of problem. So I'm going to say try with a colon up here first. Then I'm going to have my with open the file for reading uh, as the name f and for value from f that's going to read one line at a time and display uh, whatever the value is that was read from the file. Now that file might not be found and so in that case a file not found exception is raised that is a standard kind of exception and you can then use this accept clause with that named exception followed by a colon to do something about that error. In this case, we're saying uh, error opening file. Okay, so that uh, that is a way of dealing with a problem with files not found. If you want to write information into a file, then you need to use the W argument in your open function and you can say uh, f gets open file name comma w to create the file or better now that we know how to do it we can say with open the file for writing as and give the variable name that you want to to use to access that output file I'm just going to mention something here, which you can ignore. Um, my preference when I'm opening a file for input, for reading, um, I like to use the name uh, fin for input file. And for writing, I like to use the name fout for output file. Uh, if you're dealing with multiple inputs or mu multiple info files or multiple output files, of course, you'll have to do something uh, you know, even more uh, clever than than that. Um, but having f in and f out for your input file and your output file handles most situations. Here, I have a list named animals, which contains four string values. Uh, I am opening this file new data dot text for writing. Let me describe what happens there. If there is no file named newdata.txt, that newdata.txt file will be created and it will be initially empty, and you can then write information into that file. The danger here, the way we've used uh, W, is if there was already a file called newdata.txt, then this open function call, open of newdata.txt for writing, is actually going to eliminate whatever used to be in that file so that when you write more information into that file, the new information is going to replace what was already there. So, so be careful about that. Now, to display things on the screen, we've been using print. But to write information into a file, we're going to use the write method associated with uh, the output file uh, data type. So let's suppose we want to take each one of these animal strings, cow, goat, sheep, chicken, and one by one we're going to write each of these strings, each of these values, with a new line character appended into the output file. Okay, so the notation here is f dot write and a string. If you want those strings to be on separate lines from each other in a text file, then it's up to you to remember to append the new line character. Uh, f.write will not do that for you in the way that the print function will automatically add a new line character at the end of each line that's being displayed. Okay. Now, here's another somewhat more complicated example. This time we're describing what goes on with a, a comma-separated value file, uh, or how to create a comma-separated value file. Here, my data is a list. Okay, notice I've got square brackets around the whole thing. 
It is a list of tuples. So the first tuple is Smith John 27. The second tuple is Ing Pete 42. And the third tuple is Palk Marie 35. So we've got <clears throat> three tuples describing three people. And I'm going to presume, I mean, it seems fairly obvious that we've got the last name and the first name. Probably the third value is the age. Maybe the third value is a quiz score or something along those lines. And we would like to store that into a text comma separated value file. Let me actually put this code into a file, uh, into a code file that we can execute. All right, so I'm going to create a new file. And I need to get this to fit in my recording. Come here, come here. There we go. So now I've got it in my recording. Um, and I'm going to call this thing. So save as. And I'm going to call this thing write data. And that's going to be a .py file by default. Save that. Okay, so now I've got my write data file in here, and I'm going to go ahead and type this program in. So data gets a list consisting of Smith as the first string, John 27. All right, so there's my first tuple. I'm going to type this in and pick up again uh, when I'm finished. Okay, so I have completed typing this thing in, and I'm going to save it. File save. All right. And so here I have my data list. It's a list of three tuples. Last name, first name, age for three people, John, Pete, and Marie. Then I've got my with open uh, block. The name of the file is going to be numdata.txt. And I'm opening it for writing because I want to write information into this file. So that will either create numdata.txt from scratch or else it will uh, destroy the existing contents of numdata.txt so that I can write new information into it. I'm using the variable name g as my file. And for each value in this data list of tuples, I'm going to say g.write, and I'm using my formatting uh, approach here. So I'm going to write a string and then a comma, and then another string and then a comma. <laughs> a, co <laughs> a comma. <laughs> and then a base 10 integer, a decimal integer. And because I'm using write rather than print, I had better remember to add a new line character at the end of each of these if I want each of these to be treated as a line, OK? Uh, then, So that's my format specification string. And then I've got my tuple of the three values, uh, value sub 0, which is the last name, value sub 1, value sub 2, which are the first name and the age, respectively, to be written out into that file. So when I run this thing, I can do that by saying, I, I'm an idle. You should probably be using Spider or PyCharm. I'm going to say run module. OK, it ran. Nothing was displayed on the screen. So I'm going to have to uh, uh, go out and open this file to see whether it's actually there. Let me do that. I'm going to pull up a brand new file manager. Here is a file manager showing me the contents of my numdata.txt file in my course directory. And 
I can look at this by clicking on it or double clicking on it. I, if I were using Spider, uh, I could open that right in the, uh, you know, right in Spider or PyCharm. But for me, when I double click it and I'm on a Windows 10 box, it gets opened up by Notepad by default. And I see, sure enough, that there are my, there is my comma separated value lines uh, with last name, first name, age for these three people. Okay. Now, by the way, if I had named this thing .csv, numdata.csv instead, that would have worked fine. And in Windows, when I then double click on that file, it would have opened in Excel rather than in Notepad. Let me just demonstrate that. So I'll save this modified file and run it. It ran, and now I'm going to get my file manager back. There we are. And now I've got numdata.csv, which if I double click, I get Excel started. And you can only see the top part of this file, but you can see that it does have uh, the data in it. Okay, there we go. Now, when you read this file back in, remember that each line will have a new line stuck to the end of it, or on the end of it, or marking the end of it. So you're going to want to use either the rstrip function, or you can use a slice, uh, square bracket colon minus one, to get everything on the input line except for that last uh, character, the new line character at the end. Okay, so we have added the new line character because we do want to treat this text as separate lines. So each tuple we want to have written out in a formatted way on separate lines. If you don't want the new line character, if that is if you want to just have one very long line, you can leave that new line character out. Okay? Now, it turns out that the uh, files that you write this way are text files, and so they will be readable in the usual way. You can open the file with, with an R to indicate that you want to read from the file. A text file always has to contain strictly string or stir data, and so if you do have int values or float values, uh, or list values for that matter, you need to convert those things into stir data type so that you can write it out and uh, into your text file. And as we've seen here in our example program, that's easy to do. We just use the format code percent %d in our formatter, and in that way we can convert the int value, value sub 2 at the end of each one of these tuples, into its string representation. Okay? Writing almost never fails. Uh, it's, it's very rare for writing to throw an exception um, or to raise an exception in Python terminology. Opening the file may very well fail, so you might want to put a try and, and accept around your with open. Uh, writing if the file is able to open successfully, will generally succeed. About the only condition where I can imagine it failing is if you literally fill your disk and there's no more space on the disk to uh, write data to the file. If, you're, if your disk is completely full and your write statement in your Python program fails, uh, you have other serious problems <laughs> other than what's going on in your Python code. Well, we've been using the file modes uh, are if we want to read text from an existing text file, and w if we want to write text uh, to a file. And writing will either create a brand new file for the data to be written into, or writing will overwrite or destroy the original contents uh, of the file and replace it with new contents. There is also an a mode for append, and in this case, you can append information to an existing file. Well, let, let me demonstrate this. Let me pull up my shell. 
Okay, we have uh, we have this. <laughs> no, I've forgotten the name. Let me pull it back. We have this numdata.csv file, and so I can say uh, with open arg arg page up by accident with open numdata.csv this time for appending as g2 let's say and into g2 i can write hello world with a new line Now, it turns out that the write function returns to me the number of characters that were written out. Usually, we don't care about that, and usually if I, uh, if I simply execute a program containing write uh, calls, uh, that number isn't displayed. But since I am doing this in the shell itself, I see that 13. Now, does that make sense? 5, 6, 7... 12 and the new line is 13 okay so we do have 13 characters written out and because I used with open the file is now closed so if I go to my file manager I should see yes the timestamp on that file has been updated and if I open it with Excel by double clicking all right I do see <laughs> uh, hello comma world got split because this is being treated as a CSV file into the first two uh, columns of numdata.csv all right so that's the a now there's also a B mode for binary data the advantage of binary data is that it occupies less space on the disk and if you're only dealing with binary data, you know, binary integers, binary floating point numbers, it can be more efficient to read and write binary data from a, a file. Okay, so for binary, you can read data from a binary file by using the mode RB, or you can write data to a binary file by using the mode WB. If you do create a file using WB, then you can only successfully read that file using RB. Within Python, the standard function that turns uh, text files into uh, text information into binary is something called pickle, and we're going to see an example of that uh, shortly. Way back in olden times, way back in the last century when when I myself was an undergraduate, <laughs> um, computer systems were a whole lot smaller and a whole lot slower and had a whole lot less memory. And so it was efficient, both in terms of time and space, to store numerical data in binary files. It, it's still efficient, um, but it's considered to be more convenient nowadays to store all information in text files of various forms like csv files or html files or xml files uh, various other kinds of formats so that you can more conveniently share this information among uh, different kinds of applications that all are able to read these formats okay but we're going to take a look at how to create and read from a binary file uh, shortly it's also possible to open a file for both reading and writing. And you do that by saying R plus, if you have a file that already exists that you want to be able to read data from and write data into. Or you can use W plus if the file might already exist, but you don't want what it originally contains. You want to create new contents, which you may then back up and uh, you know, and modify or what have you. All right, we're not going to go through uh, 
examples of all of these. I showed you an example of appending to an existing file with A. We're going to take a look at creating and reading from a binary file. All right, so for binary data, we use the pickle library. Uh, you have to use, when you're, when you're reading from a pickled file, you have to remember to say RB. When you're writing to, uh, when you're pr writing a pickled object into a file, you have to use WB, and that means that the data are binary. One thing that that means is that if you create a binary file and you then try to open that file using an ordinary text editor, the strings, the, the series of letters, are going to be uh, readable, but all of the integer and floating point data are, are not going to be readable because instead of being translated, in, instead of the int value 123 being translated into the three characters 1, 2, 3, Instead, the bit pattern for 123 will just be directly stored into four bytes of memory in the binary file. To distinguish binary files from text files, it's usually a good idea. This isn't always done on Unix or Linux, but uh, it's usually a good idea if your uh, system applies meaning to file name extensions to use the .bin extension for binary data. Alrighty, so here is an example. And this example I'm just going to do interactively. So the first thing I'm going to do is to import the pickle module. I'm going to quickly create a set containing a combination of string values, dog and <laughs> dog <laughs> and cat and some numeric values uh, integer 7 and floating point 3.2 so now I've got my set okay um, I'm going to open set data dot bin for writing binary data and that apparently succeeded. It didn't throw an exception. Now I'm going to pickle into uh, I'm going to pickle the my set and dump that pickled my set into my output file. Okay, so dump is sort of like write, except write assumes it's dealing with text data, and, uh, well, uh, for the most part. Um, you can write binary data using write, but usually we use pickle. So we're going to create a binary encoding of my set and dump that into the output file and then close the output file. So if I then go look at my file manager, I will see that setData.bin has been created. And if I attempt to open that with, okay, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, whoops, not sure exactly what's going to happen if I try to open that with, uh, with Notepad. I think I can try to open it with MS Word. So I'll open with, and I don't want, ah, shoot, it's asking me to go to the store. All right, I'm going to, I'm going to create for myself something called a SIGWIN window. This is a, uh, a Linux emulation package that you can run on uh, Windows. And so now I can say change directory to SIG drive C. That's how I get to my C drive. And users, J. Ostland. And what's the name of this directory again? 90819. Okay, 90819. There. 
the ls command is how I get a directory listing. And here I see my setData.bin. Now, a powerful editor in the Unix and Linux world is vi. And let me edit that binary file. And what we can see here is that cat is legible, dog is legible, but the floating point value and the integer value are, you know, <laughs> Martian. I can't make any sense of what, out of what's going on uh, in that binary file directory. Uh, in that file, <laughs> in that binary file directly is what I meant to say. All right, but let's write a program, or let's write some code that we can use to read that uh, binary data back in. Now I'm going to say, let me say F2 gets open of that set data dot bin file for reading binary and I'm going to say your set gets pickle dot load from F okay so dump <clears throat> sends binary data into a file that is it takes the object which in this case is my set compresses that into binary code and sends it out to F. Here, pickle.load does the opposite thing. It reads an object from F and converts that object back into, uh, in this case, a set. All right, we wrote it out as a set. When we read it in, it will still be a set. And unsupported operation read. All right, let me investigate. Well, duh. <laughs> I simply made a mistake and tried to uh, read data from my closed output file, F. I need to say, your set is pickle.load F2. Yay, and all is well. So now... Uh, let me close, 2.close, f2.close, and now your set is <clears throat> the same set uh, that I wrote out. Although, notice that the ordering is uh, not preserved. Remember that the ordering of a set is uh, arbitrary, and so although I gave dog, cat, 7, and 3.2 in that order, when I created the set in the first place, even when I then displayed the contents of my set, uh, the order I specified was not the order that was displayed. And here, the order of the values being displayed when I read the set back in is, is yet different again. Uh, however, these, are, these sets are all equal to each other because they contain the same items uh, as each other, and the order of the items is irrelevant. All right. I can also see, I can also use type of your set to confirm that that thing is a set. All right, so that's pickling. Next, we're going to get into NumPy, which is this uh, uh, library for handling very efficiently uh, n-dimensional arrays, typically of numeric values. Okay, so NumPy contains within it lin linear algebra facilities. And in particular, uh, NumPy enables us to create one-dimensional vectors uh, of typically numeric values, uh, two or three or four or n-dimensional uh, matrices of uh, values. And in NumPy, there's a whole collection of linear algebra facilities that we can use uh, for doing vector multiplication, matrix multiplication, uh, computing uh, solutions to uh, AX equals B kinds of uh, linear algebra equations, etc. 
Now, it turns out that the NumPy library is written in the C language and therefore is able to do its computations um, at the speed of C rather than at the speed of ordinary uh, Python. If you attempted to do NumPy-like operations just using plain old lists of integers or lists of floats or lists of lists of floats in the case of a two-dimensional array, it would be brutally slow in comparison with, with how a C program could run and therefore with how NumPy runs. NumPy, in turn, is used as a foundation by the Pandas uh, sort of spreadsheet library and a whole variety of other scientific computing uh, libraries, uh, machine learning libraries, uh, etc. So if we want to use NumPy, we have to import the NumPy module. And usually, people give the abbreviation NP. Whoop, not BP, <laughs> NP. OK, so very often, if you look at books or examples about NumPy, uh, they may just say NP dot whatever to execute some facility within uh, NumPy, making the assumption that you have imported NumPy as NP. All right, so this is always a wise thing to do. And then to invoke facilities of uh, NumPy, you say NP dot and then some uh, method available within that NP uh some facility available within that uh, NumPy library. As a first thing to do, we need to know how to create uh, NumPy arrays, and then we're going to talk about how to uh, access and modify these NumPy arrays. I'm going to create here, well, this is, this is a generic example. I'm saying my array. Now, my array is going to be uh, something called an ND array, an n-dimensional array, and I can do I can create one from by saying np dot array, and then give a list or a tuple or a set or any uh, object uh, in which typically the values are all going to be the same data type. Uh, if I use integers then by default, NumPy is going to use its own internal representation, int32 or int64. And if I use floating point numbers, by default, NumPy will use its float64 data type. So let me just create a, an array of integers, 1, 4, 7, 12. OK, so I started out by describing a, or by defining a list of integer values. And np.array constructs from that an nd array. If I display my array now, notice that it says array in parentheses and then the values. This notation array is a visual flag that this thing is a NumPy uh, ND array as opposed to an ordinary list. And in fact, if I ask for the type of my array, I get told, OK, this thing is a NumPy ND array. And I can also ask for the type of my array's item sub 0. OK, you can subscript into my array using the square bracket notation like you can for a, a list or a tuple, for example. Notice here I get told that this is an int32. That means that, that, means that this is stored in NumPy's, uh, stored in the NumPy 32-bit integer format. Onward ho. Let me do a longer example. So I'm going to create an ordinary list called data1, which is going to contain 7, 10, 1, 15, 5. And I will create array1. 
as a an ANDI array from that list. And as we've seen, if I say uh, array one in my shell, what I see is the uh, sort of internal representation of that ND array. Its type is numpy to ND array. It turns out, though, if you execute print on array one, that that array parenthesis stuff will be removed. Likewise, the commas will not be displayed. And this is going to be displayed as a nice sort of mathematical vector. OK, so notice that it's not displayed as a Python list with the values separated with commas. Instead, it's displayed as, as a, effectively like a mathematical vector. Now, if I use a two-dimensional a, a list of lists, let's say. Data 2 here is a list of lists of integers. Minus 9, 0, 1 is my first list of integers. And 7, 3, 10 is my second list of integers. All right, so data 2 is a list of lists. If I print data 2, it just displays as a list of lists. If I now create from this an ND array, array2 gets np.array from data2, numpy will treat this list of lists as a two-dimensional array of integers. Uh, each, each list within this list of lists is going to be treated as a row. So this turns out to be a two row and three column uh, ND array, all right? So if I say array two, just in the shell, it's displayed uh, with uh, you know the array parentheses and then the comma notation. That's sort of the internal representation. But if I display it with print, it looks very much like a, a nice, uh, matrix. Now, it, it's not exactly a matrix because it does have nested square brackets in it, uh, unlike mathematical uh, matrix notation. Uh, but the commas are not shown. The word array is not shown. Uh, if I ask for the type of array 2, I see that it's an ND array. Now, interestingly, if I ask for the type of array 2 sub 0, well, array 2 sub 0 is the first row, and that thing also is an ND array. If I ask for type of array 2 sub 0, okay, that's the first row. And if I ask for sub 0 item, array 2 sub 0 sub 0 is this minus 9, and that is stored as uh, an int 32, a 32 bit wide integer value. There's an attribute called shape that will tell you the number of rows and columns of the array, if it's two-dimensional array. Now, for a one-dimensional array, the shape only tells you the length. However, notice that the shape is always a tuple. And consequently, for a one-dimensional ND array, the tuple uh, tells you how many items there are in that one-dimensional ND array, or you know, in this in this vector, basically. Whereas array two, if I ask for the shape of array two, I get, as I described, two rows and three columns. All right, so this is a two by three uh, ND array. You can also find out the number of dimensions using the endim attribute. So array one dot endim is just one. Oh, I misspelled it. <laughs> array one dot endim is just one and array two dot endim is two. Now it is perfectly fine uh, in NumPy to create 
three or four or five or six or whatever dimensional uh, arrays. Uh, NumPy is perfectly happy with that. But mostly we're accustomed to using uh, vectors, one-dimensional arrays, or matrices, two-dimensional arrays. So that's really what we're going to stick with. So I showed you how to use type to see the data type of an item within an ND array. It turns out that all of the items within a particular ND, ND array always have to be the same data type. And so rather than using the type uh, function, you can use the D type, you know, data type uh, attribute. Uh, like you can, so you can say array two, uh, as we said, we can say array two dot shape shows me that this is a two by three array. Array two dot end dim shows me that it is two dimensional. Array two dot d type shows me that all of the items in this end array are 32 bit wide integer values. If I create an array of, uh, of floats, let me create a F list as 1.2, 4.4, 12.3, and then create a array F as nd, np dot array from F list. Well, those are all float values. Whoops, <laughs> F list is a list. I meant to display array F. A array F is an ND array. And I can say array F dot shape to see that it is one dimensional with three items. Array F dot end dim will confirm that it's one dimensional. And array F dot type, well, uh, I'm sorry, D type, D type. Array F dot D type, these are not integers. They are stored internally as what are called float 64 values. Now, it turns out that in the C language, a 64 bit wide floating point value is the same size and format as a C language double precision value, which in turn in Python is the same thing as a float. So so a Python float and a C language double, which is equivalent to a 64-bit wide floating point value, these are all the same sizes and shapes. So, so a uh, so a uh, sorry, a Python float is exactly the same size and format as an ND array float 64. All right. In this example here, where we're creating array three uh, on this uh, slide 19, let me try that one. I'm going to say array three gets np.array. And this time, I'm using a list of mixed data types. Now, this is OK. But I have said that all of the items in an ND array have to be the same data type. So what is NumPy supposed to do if you give it a mixture of integer values and float values, that is int values and float values, uh, to construct a, uh, an ND array? Well, what happens uh, is called... Uh, upgrading, or more commonly, upcasting, what NumPy does is to choose the most complicated of the data types of the values and automatically convert all of the values into that most complicated data type. So uh, the floating point value 1.2 is, you know, is more complicated in some sense than the integer values 3 and 5 because the floating point value has not only a an integer part, but also a fraction part. What will happen is that 
integer three will get converted converted <laughs> converted to floating point three point zero likewise five to five point zero and so if I print array three notice that decimal points are displayed after the three and after the five to indicate that those things are actually being stored internally as float 64s and if I ask for array 3 dot D type I'll get told that those things are indeed float 64s okay all right now for any uh, existing ND array you can request the transpose of that ND array by asking for the dot T uh, attribute so we have this array that we created earlier called array2, which is ndim tells me it's two-dimensional. Whoops. Uh, ndim. Array2 is there. Array2.ndim is two-dimensional. Array2.shape is two by three. And if I ask for array 2.t, I get the transpose, which is going to be a 3 by 2 array. All right, let me save that into array 4, array 2.t. Now, asking for the transpose of array 2 does not modify array 2. Array 2 remains as a 2 by 3 ND array, but the transpose gives me back essentially a copy uh, of that thing, uh, transpose. So here is array 2, it hasn't changed. Here is array 4, which is the transpose. That is, the first column of array 2 becomes the first row of array 4. The second column is the second row. The third column is the third row. And transposes are very often used in uh, statistics and linear algebra um, uh, for helping you do things like multiplying matrices together uh, uh, if you want to compute correlations and so forth. Okay, so the array function is one way of creating an ND array. Uh, there are several other ways uh, of creating ND arrays, uh, several other shortcuts or, or methods that you can use. If you say np.zeros, this will give you a matrix of zeros. And in this case, uh, uh, the values will be floating point by default. So np.zeros of five is a one-dimensional array of zeros. If I ask for np.zeros uh, three by six, let's say, then I'm going to get, whoops, ah, sorry, uh, ah, yes, 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 <laughs> I always goof this up if I haven't done it for a while, um, now, the argument that you give is not, uh, a number of rows and columns, the argument that you give has to be the shape of the array that you want to create. And remember that a shape, we saw this previously, a shape is always a tuple. So if I want to get a three by six array of zeros, I have to actually specify a tuple three comma six to get that array of three by six zero point zeros. There we go. You can also ask for array for an array of one point zeros similarly with ones. So np dot ones. Uh, let's have uh, I don't know five by five. All right, there's a five by five ND array of ones. The identity matrix is the matrix that has uh, ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. An identity matrix is always square, and just for amusement reasons, I guess, or historical reasons, 
there are two different ways of requesting an identi identity matrix of a certain uh, size. If I say np.i, whoop, let me, okay, np.i, I can specify how big a matrix I want. Let me ask for a 5x5 five five matrix. And there I have a 5x5 five five identity matrix, or I can equally say identity 5 to get the same thing. I suppose I is easier to remember in type, and identity is, you know, <laughs> identity is a little more explicit or something. Okay, so we have zeros and we have ones as convenient ways of creating an anti array of all zeros or an anti array of all ones. We further have the full uh, method uh, or constructor, which allows me to create a full matrix of some arbitrary value. So if I say np.full, uh, let's say three rows, five columns of zeros, well, that's the same thing as asking for np.zeros of 3 by 5. But the advantage of full is I can give any value that I wish. So, you know, 3.3. .3. Now I have a 3 row, 5 column uh, array of values 3.3. .3. All right. So, we've introduced the idea of uh, anti arrays. An anti array is, well, NumPy, NumPy, the fundamental data type in the NumPy library is anti array. An anti array is an n dimensional array uh, of values, usually numbers, usually floating point values, although you can also have anti arrays of integers. You can have ND arrays involving strings and various other kinds of things, but that's uh, less common, let's say. And we've looked at five different ways of creating uh, initial ND arrays. We've seen array, zeros, ones, uh, I and identity, I guess I'll count those the same, and full. All right, so that gets us to the conclusion of lecture one here. And we'll continue uh, with anti-arrays in lecture two.